Welcome to the Renegade Report. I'm Jonathan. And Ramon is present. And Jonathan, I mean, it's always nice when we have, you know, smaller creators onto this channel. Uh, you know, it's very important to help small creators of the world, you know, find a wider audience. And uh, I'm glad we found one who agreed to join yes, us today. It's always good to give people exposure. You know, we're not we're not above that, Ramon. We're not above giving the, one of the little guys a little bit of exposure. And uh, today we're doing exactly that. Well, I mean, please introduce him. I mean, I'm sure people have never heard of him. So I think a fair introduction is in, you know, is due. Yes. Well, um, he's, he he runs a little known uh, YouTube channel called Sargon of Akkad. Uh, you might have heard about it. Uh, nothing, nothing major. Uh, I think, uh, how many subscribers are we at now? Uh, 960 something thousand. yeah well let's let's push it to a million so if you're not a subscriber already uh please do go there Carl benjamin thank you for joining us on the show oh thank you for giving me this opportunity <laughs> well i mean i mean the players all ours. um thank you so much for your producer for being uh so giving him his time to make this happen um so Carl, looking at at england now it's a complete fuck up uh, which was expected um <laughs> yes uh, after after the brexit vote of course but ignoring brexit for the moment do you still consider yourself a classic liberal in the traditional sense of the word yeah um more so now than ever to be honest because i've i've got a v quite deep understanding of the alternatives at the moment and they're all quite atrocious, and I think they're going to lead us to a very negative place, uh, regardless of which direction we go in. So I think um, I think we should sort of rediscover a more firm ideological commitment to what it is we want and push for that in the face of the other things that are demanding that the liberal state makes all these sort of concessions. Yeah, okay. I, I do agree with you on that regard. But if you look at the rise of... I, I'm going to ignore the left for the moment, because, I mean, they... We know who they are and what they stand for. The rise of this sort of national populism uh, by, by Trump and many people in the Eastern uh, European countries and Italy and a few others, um, and some people are even saying Brexit is a form of national populism in a way. You see the popularity of that sort of mode of political ideology. What makes you stand firm in your principles without necessarily wanting to you know, move further to the national populist side um, because it's so popular at the moment. I think um, I think the national populist side of things is the closest we're going to get to a grassroots uh, classically liberal movement. I think that very, I think that mo most people who are supporting that sort of thing aren't acting from a consciously ideological position. They're just looking at their own direct interests and saying, "I want that." that to be something that is uh, fulfilled by my government. Um, but most of the things that they're asking for are not in any way, as far as I can see, contradictory to a sort of classical liberal worldview. Um, I think the, the the worst part about any sort of populist movement, and I, I say this with a great deal of love, is that they're not generally very well refined. And so with the left, you get very professional activists and they look great. They can travel all over the world and they've got all the money in the world. But with the sort of populist movement, it's a lot more rough around the edges, which sorry if you can hear the dogs back in the background, um, which is which is in my in my view much more preferable because I think that's a lot more real. And it's always going to have these kind of outliers and the and the thing of it being a populist movement. But I think that um I think the sort of classical liberal types can definitely win the arguments in any regard in these movements because essentially i think these people do in a latent way want to essentially be left alone you know just stop messing up the country and we don't really care that much you know it's and the sort of classical liberal framework i think is very compatible with the things they want i i spoke with tommy robinson about this at length and at the end of it, it was just but that's what i want you know that's that's what i'm looking for i'm just looking to not have islamist gangs you know beat us or throw bricks through our windows or groom our sisters and cousins and things like this and so i don't think that the national populist movements at least in the english speaking countries um are particularly reflective of any kind of ethno nationalist desires i don't actually see them as being particularly racist i just see them as reacting to frankly attacks on the group that are coming from the outside whether it be from the radical leftists or the islamists who do view the world in distinctly collectivist ways and are racial in their politics so i think they're just 
reacting on those fronts? I think that's I think that's a, a reasonable a reasonable position. Look, I'm I'm going to agree with you on a lot because I'm the other classical liberal on the discussion here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll let Ramon push back against all the classical liberal ideas. I wonder if you feel that libertarians as well could be a bit more refined in their positions. Um, I find I find them similar in the in the way you sort of are describing the nationalist, um, uh, the sort of populist, not nationalist, populist position. Mm. Uh, where you know classical liberalism really does allow you to understand uh, the realities of any given situation and kind of apply the principles to it but also understand that there's uh, going to be different positions depending on the situation you find yourself in um, because that's just the way life is sometimes um with uh, our, some of our libertarian friends and you know we have many of them uh, often on the show in fact uh, you know, borders, as an example, is one where uh, we find ourselves disagreeing, especially with our very staunch libertarian uh, friends and allies who, who who are basically hold no different position to what a Democratic candidate for the uh, 2020 nomita- nomination holds, which is uh, open borders or where we should be where we should be looking to to go. Now, we might think going there ultimately would be not a bad thing, um, but it doesn't seem like that's a reality we can actually deal with right now. Uh, we've seen that in multiple countries across Europe. Uh, certainly it was a big part of the Brexit vote uh, in terms of motivating people to vote the way they did. Um, uh, we've, you, you know, it, we've, we've just seen that it, it, it's at this stage is not an option. Um, wh- what do you make of, of those sort of positions? Um, I'm very, very sympathetic to libertarians. You know, and it's, it's, I've only, I think I've only spent, I mean, I've done a few live streams debating with anarcho capitalists and sort of the more radical libertarians just about the, the basic principles of what we're talking about. But um, it's never been with any great animus. You know, it's, it's always been on the understanding that we're essentially on the same side. Um, so I'm generally quite loath to criticize libertarians just because I, I don't, I, I don't want to go after them or anything like that. I don't want there to be any mistaking me doing that. Yes. Um, but I, I do think that a lot of libertarians are a bit more ideological than I'm personally willing to become in that regard. Because I think that the the primary um, goal of any worldview should be correspondence with reality. As in, you know, how accurately are, are you representing as many perceivable aspects of a situation as possible to be as accurate as possible? So you can actually be more informed about what's going on and make more informed decisions. And it, sometimes I do find like with the case for open borders, things like this, I find that the libertarians and the socialists are analyzing the situation in the same way They they tend to view people as economic units and that alone, the sort of very materialistic view of things. Um, and they ignore the social and cultural impact that it has on a society. Uh, as long as the money is going up, then everything should be fine. And that's not the case. There, there are definitely, uh, cultural, particularly uh, like behaviors that are particularly damaging, especially to people who didn't actually vote to have the borders opened, uh, didn't actually, you know, have any kind of say in this and are now finding themselves with, um, people who, with whom they don't agree on some really fundamental things. Uh, the, the example being in Britain, the, um, Muslim community, but not every Muslim community. Uh, it depends where the Muslim community has come from originally. But, um, but there are some areas in Britain where there's particularly um, literal interpretation of Islam. Uh, half of our mosques are Diabandi mosques, which is the same version of Islam that the Taliban uh, follow, actually. Uh, it produces the burqas and whatnot. Um, they, they, have the, they have a very, very different view of the value of a person to which um, British liberalism does. Uh, British liberalism suggests that every person has an innate value as a person. but um, Many, many of these grooming gangs in courts have been revealed to have the complete opposite opinion that because certain, say, English girls don't dress with modesty, they don't have value as a person. And the, the words they will use to describe them are worthless white whores. Um, this is not a view that they have of the Muslim women who do cover themselves appropriately mm. uh, following the sort of Quranic injunction towards modesty. Um, and so that that's a, that's a, that's a two different co- a conflict of values. Uh, I'm not saying either one's right or wrong, but the the point is that produces a massive friction between these communities because one community believes it has license to operate 
against a certain demographic in the other community. Uh, that's the that's the cause of the grooming gangs, and it's driving the poor, like people who didn't vote to have a new community introduced into their midst. It's driving them mental because the establishment is protecting the immigrants. Um, so I've actually forgotten the question. <laughs> So that was that's a lot to like. I'm trying to. I, the thing is, I'm trying to pass out my language very, very, very carefully, um, yes. because I don't believe that what I've said there is something bigoted. I think that that is the the reality that that is an accurate represent, representation it, of the belief systems it, that are going on. It's interesting because um, when you were talking about some of that stuff, you know, you, you reminded me a bit of Tucker Carlson and 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 how he talks about. Um, the sort of left behind American, uh, yeah. you know, he, he and when he yeah. talks to uh, issues around um, AI, for example, and 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 how many truck drivers there are in the United States, or or how many people there are who are at the tills at a at a grocery store, um, uh, he he very much uh, embodies a similar type of uh, of idea around um, those sort of uh, ignored groups and mm. and um the the idea that with with what you think is progress uh it may actually be very damaging and and i i actually um you know i don't particularly agree with him necessarily on a lot of the stuff although i did hear him uh speak once um, i can't remember on whose show it was but he was on someone else's show and, and mentioned all of these issues and and he was talking about uh you know the the AI the AI revolution and and he mentioned that it, you know in the industrial revolution many people were left behind and it's all fine and well now uh, and we all look at it as as um, uh, you know they were luddites and 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 we're we're better off and and I suppose we are um, but those individuals who lost their jobs and lost their homes and lost their income and and couldn't feed their families weren't and uh, it's it, it it may be a noble cause to to actually be considerate of those individuals. Um, yeah, I would personally suggest any kind of um, any kind of you know um, educational prospects or any kind of humanitarian aid that can be done in that regard is obviously preferable to not. And and that ultimately was the great problem that Thatcher had with the mines. Uh, she wasn't wrong to close the mines. They were an expense and were going to keep getting worse. But it it was the way that she did it that was um well considered brutal by the communities in which it happened. And you know, you can't really say that it wasn't. So um yeah, I think uh th again this this again came from quite a libertarian view from Thatcher. Um it's not that the it's not that they're wrong, it's it becomes ideological. And I think when anything becomes ideological, you lose sight of the actual human effect, which honestly is, I think the problem with the labor party at the moment in my country, they've, they've become wildly ideological and they're, they're totally for mass immigration. They're totally for socialism. They, they've, they've become really quite radical. It's actually quite scary. Well, your Labour Party is uh, quite centrist in South Africa, so um, can't, <laughs> well, can't, can't yeah. so lucky. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot where I was. Um, where I was speaking to. Yes, yeah, so uh, I, I have to say every every piece of news about any of your parties that comes out of your country, I find genuinely terrifying. Um, as well as all. Of what the are you other talking ones. about? With us, just yesterday, we slaughtered a goat to chase away the evil spirits and hopefully bring the, success to the 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 town of Durban, the city that of Durban. That didn't actually happen, did it? No, it it literally happened. I can oh. happily send you the article. Oh, Jesus um, Christ, please, about please, a few please. a few months ago, we we slaughtered a we slaughtered a we slaughtered a goat on one of our um, top beaches in the country, and we do have beautiful beaches uh, in Cape Town. <laughs> um, in fact, the best beach in the country, Jesus. Clifton Four. Um, yeah. We slaughtered a beach. We slaughtered a, a goat on that beach um, to chase away racism. Um, because there are many work? white people go to that beach. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, nothing really racist had happened. It just there were too many white people apparently, and and I mean the goat slaughtering did chase them away. You know, they're not uh, they're not big on yeah. animal slaughtering. It's not part of their culture. But but um, yeah, we we do these kinds of things all the time. So I mean, maybe Jeremy Corbyn must take a goat into uh, Trafalgar Square or something like that. You know what? I think he'll. Pro I think he probably will. I honestly, <laughs> at, the, at this point, I think they're so far gone that they will actually do that. 
And then when he does, we can call him out for cultural appropriation. Then he can go to jail. Brilliant. I think it's a great yes. plan. We should do that. Yes. We should do that. But Carl, interestingly, I mean, you spoke about ideology just now. So mm. here's the thing with classical liberalism. And obviously, I want your thoughts because I'm asking you the question. Yeah, of course. So classical liberalism is basically uh, people have uh, individual rights, um, they are autonomous individuals. What, in, in a rational sense, when you say that, you know, these communities that have become ideological and have different cultures, you know, sort of clashing against each other, how does classical liberalism fit into that? Because under a, a rationalistic classical liberal paradigm, the, the Muslim has just as many rights as the Englishman in Luton, right? But they have yeah. completely different cultural uh, pra practices and histories and ethnicities and religions. How is that ever, I mean, if they're both equal, how do you know which one's correct and incorrect? How do you make that judgment call? Well, this, I'm, I'm actually really glad you brought this up because what you're speaking to is the failure of integration in my country. And the failure of integration in my country is comes from two things. Uh, the, the quantity of the immigrants who have come and the distribution of them around the country and hate speech laws. Um, they were they were allowed to congregate in certain areas to particularly large numbers and when that happens what you've done is effectively allowed a colony to form um there are something like 25 percent of bangladeshi women in my country don't speak english um and yet they're so you know they just live in these communities and i know what this is like because i effectively lived on one of those in germany uh, i i spent eight years on jhq which was joint headquarters for the allies after World War II in Germany, and I don't speak a word of German because everything in this colony is uh, in the language that you're used to, the, from the country you come from, because there's no particular cultural impetus for you to not do it. In fact, it's desirable for you because it's a lot easier for you. And since the Germans had no way of forcing us essentially through you know cultural or legal means to become like the Germans, because they were the defeated enemy, um, we continued being as English as you like. Uh, the same is happening in the UK with the mass immigration that has come from um, primarily, I would say, Pakistan, um, because there are lots of other East Asian cultures that they're not necessarily integrating, but they're not causing any particular cultural frictions and no one really notices them. Um, but the, the behavioral um, differences between the English and Pakistani community, um, these would normally be dealt with by the law which in this case is actually defending their crimes by simply ignoring them, or by actually imprisoning um, the, say, fathers of girls who were trying to go and get their daughters back. Uh, they, <laughs> that's happened, right? And then you have hate speech laws, which let's blanket criminalize like harsh criticism effectively um, the sort of thing someone says to hurt someone else's feelings uh, this is not done for no reason this is done in order to get them to realize that you've hurt someone else uh, you don't go around attacking people unless they've somehow wronged you um, and that's what that is for and what this all is is part of a cultural process that modifies both cultures over time because yet yeah, there will be strife, but the the whole point that the liberal state um, imposes, is, the whole order that the liberal state imposes, is one of non-violence. So you can say what you like to hurt one another's feelings, but you can't hit each other. And that's where the authorities, it's the behavior that the authorities draw the line on. And that's just not happening at the moment. It's in fact the other way. Violence is, for example, during Tommy Robinson's MEP campaign, he went to Oldham and the police literally escorted this it looked like a 200 strong group of Muslim men up to his uh, campaign rally where they then promptly started fighting. And it's like, what are you doing? That's being in tacit permission of the violence that's going to be done. If you're actually going to walk them up there, you know that they're going to fight. So you've got to keep them separated. The whole point, no violence, but they don't, they, they are not acting again as they should be. You know, they should, mm. they should be acting impartially, but they're acting partially to one side. Um, but the, the whole the whole reason I bring this up is because it's these sorts of cultural pressures that encourage communities to change their behavior. Um, it's the to, so to be conformable to one another. Um, this is being prevented from happening, and so the the rift is growing bigger and bigger as the damage mounts up on either side, and neither side gets any kind of resolution. Um, it's it's 
it's going to cause a great deal more frustration. And it's because the the progressive uh, sort of socialist uh, speech and morality police are are frankly uh, in control of everything. So, so is your argument that this is actually due to a lack of classical liberal ideas in a society yes. that, that causes the, the conflict and the tension? Because if you had yeah. free speech rights yeah. and uh, no, um, what do you call it, uh, censorship or you know the local community or the local authority rather do not interfere with those sort of relationships do you think integration would be a lot easier and yes. is integration in and of itself something good um, um Carl? yes I, I yes, and you, yes. If, if, definitely if i moved um, to england right uh, sorry to interrupt i yeah. moved to england um okay I, i'm i think I, I i have broadly the same culture as most english people i would think he, he has mm-hmm. french ancestry i wouldn't let him near your country oh definitely well, was, not yeah uh, yeah. That was the point of Brexit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm joking. I'm joking. No worries at all. But what, if I may ask, why why is assimilation that important? Because once again, I'm sorry to go back to this point. Classic liberalism says the individual is very important and they have inherent rights. Why can't a Muslim be a not a proper Muslim, maybe that's the wrong word, but why must a Muslim be a Muslim with English, sorry, uh, you know, an English shade or English character rather than just a Muslim as he is in Pakistan? Um, if there was no uh, conflict between these two communities, uh, if if there was enough of a shared set of values that underpin their behavior, then it would. Uh, there's, you know, there are Hindus here who are perfectly Hindu. There are Chinese people who are perfectly Chinese, and they're not causing any trouble. Uh, no one, like, there, there are loads of Sikh temples and stuff. No one, no one's ever complaining about these temples. But there are lots of people complaining about mosques and the behavior of Muslims because the underpinning uh, value system has this conflict specifically about do people have inherent value. Um, the question of whether it's desirable is it, obviously, I mean, these people have to live together because I think the alternative is a descent into violence. I think that you have to, I mean, that you know, the one community is not going to tolerate the predation of another community on the most vulnerable members of that community. That's just not going to happen. That's it is barbaric to ask it. Um, there has to be a, an accord if these people are going to live cheek by jowl. Otherwise, you're going to have horrible, horrible things happening and it's never going to stop. Uh, so, yeah, I think that there has to be a common accord in values. And I think that in this case, it's totally unreasonable to ex- to expect the people who live in the country already to accept the new value system that's come in. I mean, they, like I said, they didn't vote for immigration. And why the hell should they? You know, it's I don't understand why they should have to give up the value system because some people have moved in. If anything, why did you go to another country if you weren't prepared to accept their value system? So it, I think the onus is on the, the new arrivals to modulate their values in order to accom- accommodate the values of the existing culture that are there. Yeah, I mean, I sort of agree with you in theory, but that's exactly what our government says about people of our race. <laughs> you live right. here, but you have these weird Western imperialistic values anyway. You must become more African, whatever that entails. They never actually tell us what it means to be African. I mean, I agree with you in terms of assimilation. I think people should uh, sort of uh, get along and, and have processes to do that. Um, but it's how can I explain it? You know, that's what is said about us as we, we still sit as foreigners, despite being born in South Africa, we just happen to be white. And it's a very racially classified society here uh, on the behest of the government. They, they love it. So it, it, it works both ways too. I mean, I mean, the one culture is better than the other. I think it's well, fair to I say. think, I think, the, sorry to, Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry to yeah. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not saying that one, uh, one culture isn't better than the other. And they're both equal in value. Um, what, what I'm saying is there has to be a, a shared, um, under sort of uh, underpinning towards any value to any, anyone's behavior is underpinned by what they think is the right thing to do. Um, and I, I'm sure that, like the white people of South Africa aren't hurting the black people of South Africa. Like, like, do you, I mean, are they? Am I, am I, am I just unaware of this? It's a very, well, it's a very loaded question. It depends who you ask. Right. Okay. Well, th- th- no, but that's just, just that, based on, that, sorry, Carl, but just based on yeah, the facts, yeah. like racial violence, white on black is, is basically null. 
Uh, you do right. the other way around, but yeah. there's yeah. far more black South Africans than whites. So, I mean, you can't draw a right. parallel, but uh, on the stats, yes, white South Africans are not causing harm to black yeah. South Africans. So, so I don't understand what they could be asking you for. And it seems to me that they're talking shit. Um, so, no, I don't think there's any legitimate grievance. So why would you have to change? Um, but I think that if, I mean, this is the thing, if there's no legitimate grievance, so me and the Sikh community, I'm not going to demand that they change their behavior. But if a different community is creating a legitimate grievance, uh, then I think it's reasonable to demand that they change their behavior. But it doesn't have to be an absolute. If nothing's going on, then why do anything? You know, if everyone's just living happily next to each other, why do anything? Um, I was specifically speaking about a community that's hurting another. My apologies. Should be more sure. No, no, and I get that. Jonathan, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll put you in just now. Just one last question Thank from you. my side. Uh, so, so based on, on what you just said now, if, you know, hmm. we have to uh, erase conflict and there still must be underlying principles and people must assimilate to the English tradition, why aren't you a civic nationalist? I am a civic nationalist. Is what, do you, what do you understand? What do you understand by the phrase? Sorry, maybe we've got different definitions. Oh no, it's it's about uh, being uh, nationalistic and protective about uh, some certain uh, cultural aspects of your society and how it works, the legal system, uh, the yeah, be surrounding it. Is that classical liberal? In a I way, don't, um, I don't, I don't see why not. Okay, no, no, I'm not if, challenging. I'm just, no, 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 um, I, I know it's a fair question, sure. um, but I don't, I don't see any reason why it can't be. So. That's, I do consider myself a civic nationalist. Okay, brilliant. Okay, now I get you perfectly fine. <laughs> no reason. No, reasons. <laughs> no um, I, I think there's look, there's a lot to discuss uh, in terms of the concept of integration, the concept of unity, the concept of people following Western values. I think I think there are multiple levels here as well because um, when we talk yeah. about uh, you know. Western values, uh, that's a broad term, and it, it's something that uh, most countries in the inverted commas West, some are not even in the West, to be honest, um, uh, just follow, and, and it's just a way that, that we, we see sort of since, I suppose, the Enlightenment and, and somewhat before that as well in certain trends, um, we just see as a way we've, we've come to behave as a society and so when when people come in and they want to behave uh, directly counter to those values that creates an obvious problem not so much when it's a, a, a few people but a, a large problem when it becomes a community um, yeah go um, just a just to I think the important distinction is between um, action and speech I think mm. that's the most important distinction because like a physical action hurting one another you know doing anything really breaking property and whatnot uh, the, these these are uh, from like a liberal frame f framework totally invalid but speech mm. and discussion and all that sort of thing that's you know, eminently desirable even if it's horrible you know, yeah. there's still got to be a time and a place for that sort of thing. So I, I think that that's the primary distinction I would make um, in regards to this sort of subject. Because I think that there's the question of like, um, when can the state and when can't the state actually exercise some sort of authority in this regard? And I think that it is only on that regard. But sorry. No, that's fine. I, I, I think what the state sometimes does is, you know, there's useful idiots and then there's mm -hmm. sort of people who are actually trying to do do bad, do evil. Um, and and so so uh, I'll tell you what I'm what I mean by that. In, in, yeah. yeah. In, in, so the South African government and uh, to an extent, perhaps your government would justify having uh, hate speech laws um, would justify jailing people um, for mm -hmm. three years for using um, hate speech. Um, uh, they would justify that as saying that they're bringing people together, um, that they're they're preventing upsetness from happening, and in the way of presenting preventing that from happening, they therefore um, no specific party gets upset, and as a result of that, we have a more sort of integrated, unified country. But actually, it does the complete opposite because one group inevitably feels um, sort of victimized by by these yeah. laws. Uh, so. So and and I, I think sometimes that that is done out of ignorance. You know, the idea of uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, I think I think a lot of stuff that's done in government is just done by people who um, uh, live in kind of u unicornia and and think that mm -hmm. uh, things are good ideas because they look like good ideas. And some policy wonk has told them it'll work out wonderfully, um, when it's very clear that to anyone that's with a bit of analysis that it won't. Um, but then, of course, 
there's a broader thing happening worldwide, which is uh, this sort of uh, cultural Marxism, postmodernism, you know, going down the Jordan Peterson road here, but but which is actually an intent to to do this, an intent to create these divisions, um, and an intent to 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 create these authoritarian and police societies. Uh, you know, I, I, it sort of annoys me quite a bit because I've I've gone into a lot of um, the, the sort of Frankfurt School and and mm. and and how they spread through the U.S. and Herbert Marcuse and what he actually said he wanted to do, which mm. is what you're seeing today in the United States um, in terms of um, you know the socialism, Marxism, uh, cultural Marxism, literally finding itself in in their government, um, and you find people in their government uh, spreading these ideas. Um, this was this was always part of their sort of plan. This was always part of the Frankfurt School's plan of how they would uh, they th they essentially gave up on 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 uh, spreading Marxism through 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 an armed method. They realized that the Bolsheviks had essentially failed, and um, and the the better way to do it was to take over every other cultural aspect of the society until those people ultimately uh, the, the 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 culture of the society agreed with you and then all those people infiltrated every aspect of that society and then you would own it um mm. and you know if you look at the us you could make an argument that almost everywhere except the military so far is uh, is is has at least somewhat been infiltrated by these people the media is completely overrun e by ev it. even our our military is showing the signs of this um i think i think we better be cautious in describing it as an infiltration uh, not that it wasn't initially sure. um it certainly was the the long march genuinely was a thing that the communists did consciously um but now it has um sort of boiled over into a cultural movement um and so what we're seeing now is not the infiltration now it's true believers um and people who don't really have a counter argument going well i guess that we have to change our flag to a gay pride flag then don't we and it's like well do you you know why you know why you know you need to start questioning these things um so yeah i think that's that's the most important thing um i i think that the intent of the frankfurt school types was still actually the same intent. Uh, I just think we're talking about the methods there, really. Um, the, and the intent of the activists now, uh, certainly, is to achieve equality, um, which, frankly, is quite a terrifying concept if you actually spent a bit of time thinking about it. Um, the only way we can all be equal is if they were all exactly the same. And any amount of difference between us is going to be some form of inequality. And if you've got activists whose sole goal is to eradicate inequality, which does appear to be the case, um, then at what point do they stop? And they certainly don't stop at oppression. They don't stop at socialism, taking people's hard-earned money. They don't stop at silencing you. They don't stop at deplatforming you. They don't stop at punching you in the street if they think you're a Nazi. They don't stop at shutting down your bank account if you're um, Martina Marcota and Chase Bank or the TERFs who were deplatformed from the co-op, their co-op bank account, a group of TERFs. Was, like, they, there's, there doesn't seem to be any particular end. I mean, they, they, don't, they don't stop at terror attacks on border facilities. You know, there's, there's no particular limiting principle there. And so just... I know I've kind of lost where I'm going because I'm just thinking, Christ, we're in trouble. <laughs> the left, the left, yeah. absolutely out of control. But, um, don't, don't but that's, that's what weird. we'll do to get equality. The, you know, don't you find it weird that it's the the gamers who actually created you know, the, the counter cultural war with Gamergate? I mean, Gamergate was what, 2013, 2014, somewhere on there. I think, I think you uh, rose up. 2014, it was. Yeah. 2014, you rose up. Uh, you became more prominent during those times. Uh, Milo mm. became more prominent. Gamer McInnes became more prominent. And it was a bunch of bloody gamers who did it uh, <laughs> because the, the gaming press said, well, you know, games need to be more inclusive. Yeah. And the gamers are like, no, fuck you. <laughs> we don't care what you say. <laughs> and and they actually won this this bloody cultural war. I, I'd again, say it was a stalemate. I'd say oh, it was a stalemate. stalemate yeah. The, I, I mean, we, we didn't get rid of the games. We didn't get rid of the cultural Marxism from games journalism, but uh, game game again effectively dictated the culture against them. Um, you know, people like yeah, these these people are just authoritarians. I, I guess that there's quite a, a, a libertarian streak in gaming circles, just because you know people just want to do what they want to do and just be left alone.
basically. Yeah, absolutely. But but it's strange because for the first time, the the the, the elites were you know fought against in a, in a very not a coordinated way, but in a very vociferous way, and they sort of uh, back down in in some way. I mean, if you look at the the rise of uh, what's her name, um, feminist frequency, and all those people mm, that came Rihanna Wu, right? Uh, well, yeah him too. Uh, yeah. When they came to prominence at that time, those people are no longer relevant at all. But their opponents still are. I guess some would argue Milo is not relevant anymore. But I think he's very relevant in, in some ways. He's still getting uh, shows. Your, your yeah. YouTube channel still growing. Gary McInnes has been deplatformed from every platform, but his YouTube is going strong. So the opponents from there have spread into the the, the, the mainstream culture and the mainstream culture is trying to, you know, erode them away a little bit oh, as yeah, well. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're, as a, they're being censored because they, they're, they're successful. That's the area. Absolutely. But as a starting point, I think it's a massive victory in terms of just mm. people waking up and saying, oh, look, it can be fought. We don't have yeah. to accept it. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Um, the, uh, sorry, it just occurred to me what I was supposed to add at the end of what I was saying. Um, the, the, whole, um, the whole equality thing is actually a genuinely scary thing, especially as we're not for equality. Uh, we're actually for difference. You know, like that's the thing that we need to, I think the, the sort of liberal libertarian sort of side of things should really start attacking the concept of equality and being like, hang on a second, you know, it, nobody's really equal. And I don't even know if that's desirable. What we're for is freedom. You know, if, if by equality, you mean, you know, all equally being left alone to our own devices, probably for the best, but you know, that was, Something I just want to add on that, but sorry. Um, yeah, with Gamergate. Well, um, we, yeah, oh, sorry. sorry carry on. On no, no, no. You got. You go. I just wanted to say about equality. Uh, I, I, you know, I say to Ramon, and I've said it on the show a couple of times. If you guys lose the culture war in uh, in the UK and the US, you want to know what that looks like. You need to look no further than South Africa. Uh, yeah. The the thing is, is um, a, a lot of what goes on here is is all about equality and all about it, it gets spoken about a lot if if any yeah. sort of controversial law gets passed it's all about equality uh, or re reducing inequality people yeah. are obsessed with with inequality in this country um, obviously there are large gaps between the haves and the have nots and uh, you know the gini coefficient is everyone's favorite um, uh, uh, thing to quote uh, but but you, you, you know we we have almost all our policy informed by uh, getting us somewhere towards equality, and so we're we're sort of somewhere between you know a country that doesn't do that um, or hasn't yet started down that path, and a country which has gone completely down that road, like North Korea, for example, um, and and we're sort of. We keep adding in things to try and make things more equal, and every single one of them is is just completely disastrous. Uh, it's yeah. it's an it's an it's a never ending um, sort of uh, you've got never ending examples. Uh, our and and what's hilarious is 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 the it's it's almost like one example that they keep trying to fix. So in this country, we've got um, black economic empowerment, uh, which started out as affirmative action. Um, for the majority, yeah. For the majority, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, currently the country is about 45 million black people and then 10 million other uh, groups, uh, about yeah. five, six million white people and some Indian people. Um, and uh, and yeah, so the, the, the it started out as affirmative action and then it became this thing called black economic in empowerment. Um and essentially, it's it's just been a, a Ponzi scheme for for the wealthiest. So there's there's you can count them. Uh, you know, there's, hmm. there's sort of ten ten black uh, black people who've become billionaires, um, and then a, a few hundred, maybe a few thousand, who've become millionaires, and then obviously the rest of the forty five million who've who've kind of been left behind. Um, those who haven't been left behind have been picked up by what we have, what's left of capitalism. Uh, so we have uh, still got some sort of a free market in the sense that we have quite a large um, private sector still which hasn't yet been killed um, and those um, that's been able to pick up about 10 million almost 10 million black people into what is now the, the black middle class um, still leaving behind about 35 million people and and of those um, you know we're looking at probably around 16 million uh, youth 
who are unemployed. I think I think that's the latest number. Um, so so yeah, we've got a we've got a major major issue in that respect. But um, <laughs> we're a good example of what happens if you chase equality. It 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 really yeah. is a, a recipe for absolute disaster. Well, the thing is, just by by very the very nature of what it is, the the only um, the only thing you can be aiming for with equality is the equal of the lowest common denominator. Uh, you're naturally going to be pulling down the great in order to level them out with the low. Um, what else is there? You know, that's that's going to have to be how it is. So, of course, it's destructive. But but equality is also most importantly, it's a violent rejection of human autonomy and, and yeah. ability as well. Uh, and yeah. that's what frustrates me the most. Um, if you look at surveys in South Africa, you'll notice eight out of ten South Africans across all racial lines are centrist. Uh, they want jobs, they want uh, education for their kids, they want food on the table, and they want to watch Netflix, and then just repeat that, you know, uh, till yeah. the cows come home. They don't care about other people, they don't care about race quotas in sports or any of that shit whatsoever. But those people are not seen in the political sphere, because A, they don't vote. Uh, more people don't vote than do vote in this country. And B, is not uh, is not seen in the cultural uh, sphere either, because there's no media that accurately portrays those people's uh, ambitions uh, in the public. So basically you have what, about 30 million South Africans who are just not represented in the public at all. And they're too busy to represent themselves. They've got, uh, you know, children to feed and they've got uh, jobs to do and all sorts of other things. But because they are not heard, um, you know, the government will say, well, equality is important. And the way we will get equality done is by taking away stuff from this group and giving it to this group and then it will be equal. But it, it is not about giving more rights to the poor at all. It's about stripping rights from the rich and giving it to the poor. It's not about giving title deeds to poor people who live on state land, for example. It's about having the worst education system in the world. It's not about fixing the education system. It's about making sure that everyone else has to use that education system. It's not about giving medical vouchers um, to mm -hmm. the poor. It's about making sure that the private hospitals have to uh, give a treatment to poor people and they shouldn't have to pay for it either. So it's about really stripping down competence uh, and it's about not trusting the poor to do it by themselves because they're not given the rights to do it by themselves either. It's it's a horrific, horrific way to look at the world. But I mean, if you have power and you greedy and unscrupulous, it's the, you know, that's the obvious way to go. It's interesting. If you do it along racial lines as well, that, that allows the uh, rich elite who happen to be black to forever do this uh, because they're never going to be included in those people who are hit by the scythe. Um, they're outside of it. You know, it's oh, just it's, a, white it's, yeah. it's the continuous marketing strategy of what the, you know, our, our government here is the African national Congress mm. um, Mandela's party and, and, uh, and they, that, that is basically been their marketing strategy over the last 10 years now. Um, you know, Mandela was, was not that guy. He was, he was, he was a unifier. And I think that's fair to say, I know people are critical of him on both sides. It's quite interesting. His own parties become critical of him, in the last few years, um, certainly some more radical elements, because he was too nice to white people, as far as they're concerned, and he he was a they they say that he was a sellout. Um, I've seen uh, I've seen something similar in the United States where uh, Martin Luther King quotes have been uh, removed from woke universities because mm -hmm. he's too centrist. Uh, yes, yeah. you know he's he's essentially not following the playbook. Yeah, Sorry. you can never judge someone by their character. You must yeah. judge them by the color of their skin. Yes. Um, so, so yeah, it's. Uh, but but what's happened now? I mean, we've we've had uh, we've had marketing campaigns by them. In fact, uh, in the elections uh, a few years ago, um, they actually started something called the War Room, an election war room, um, which was discovered afterwards. Which they they put about, I think it was about fifty million rand, roughly. Uh, uh, what two and a half million pounds, which is a fair amount of uh, Tom, and um, they they put that in there, and basically they they stoked racial tension uh, by uh, um, promoting 
any kind of uh, stories which involved um, sort of race issues or something between a, between white and black. Um, so the the big story at the time was an unheard of woman, about a 60-year-old woman at the time. Uh, she was an estate agent who I think maybe sold two houses a year if she was lucky. Um, she she posted something racist on Facebook. She uh, had been holidaying at one of uh, one of the, the sort of beach um, 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 holiday sites mm. uh, for the year, and and she posted something about monkeys on a beach um, because there was a lot of litter on the beach, and and she posted this this racist comment about monkeys on the beach, um, and. It uh, obviously was a racist comment, but in, for the most part, it would be something that would kind of go unnoticed. And, uh, you know, I'm sure people uh, would have, who know her would have said, well, that's hopefully, uh, they would have said that's unacceptable and all the rest of it. Um, but that was made into a national issue. Uh, it was uh, in our news for two weeks at least in, in terms of front page news for at least two weeks. They hunted this woman down. Uh, they doxed her. Uh, they doxed her wife. Uh, not her wife. Her her daughter was doxed um, uh, and then threatened to be raped, um, who obviously had nothing to do with any of it. Um, there, there was a whole bunch of other stuff that happened. And, and the story itself was used to drive this narrative of – uh, sort of us versus them, uh, which is also interesting because, as Ramon uh, mentions, in in all the polling data, uh, South Africans want to get on with each other. They don't dislike each other based on race. Uh, you know, um, if you look at do you trust your neighbor based on race, uh, I think it's something like 87% of black people trust white people as their neighbors and and 86% mm. mm. of whites on blacks. And it's, you know, the the, the trust and the the the, the is, is high and the hatred is actually very low um, but the the political parties are very good at pushing this and and they've they've done it particularly well and they've specifically invest invested in this strategy um, and that's I mean that's the ruling party we then have this sort of split far left party that's come away from the ANC called the EFF I'm sure you actually yeah, away, spoken yeah. about yeah. Julius Malema before yeah. um, this is the the guy who says things like we're not going to kill white people yet yeah. Um, or he's going to another one of his more recent ones was he's going to slit the throat of whiteness. Um, uh, and, you know, these are the kinds of comments he makes and he makes these sort of statements while can firing. I, sorry, yeah. can I ask you, how do you interpret that? He's going to slit the throat of whiteness. What, what does that mean to you? So he used the word whiteness on purpose um, yeah. because he's become quite clever and our hate speech laws uh, sort of threaten to catch him. Uh, for for his words. Now, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, hypocrisy when it comes to the prosecution of those laws because, in general, white people have been uh, held and found to be guilty. The, the woman I just told you about, in fact, was found guilty and ordered to pay a fine. And there was another woman recently who went on a racist tirade. There's no other way to describe what she did. It was completely racist, but she was actually put in, in jail. Uh, she's currently serving a, a three-year term in jail, I think a one year suspended, years, yes. um, for, for saying a number of racist um, things to some police officers. Um, so so it, it, it isn't prosecuted equally, but I think he's been careful. And so he said the word, he said white, whiteness, instead of saying white people, hmm. um, because he knew he could then use the whole concept of uh, you know what it what whiteness is this sort of metaphorical embodiment mm. um, of white people white culture um racism because in in south africa the the assumption at least from these kinds of politicians is if you're white then you are racist there is no salvation for you it is original sin in the mm. same way that the new york mm. times talks about white privilege as original sin um and and yeah i think i think uh, he was just being clever with his words Oh, um, undoubtedly. I just wanted mm. to know what you interpreted it as. Because yeah. I, th I think that when they say whiteness, I think they mean um, uh, Anglo culture, like uh, sort of like you'd find, you know, ca in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, America, South Africa, um, you're going to find a common adherence to certain kind of institutions, certain views of human rights and, and certain um, behaviors that mm -hmm. you you know you'd find appropriate and inappropriate and i think that that whole thing is what they're describing as whiteness 
Oh, it gets, it's more it's more than that. Sorry, Ramon. It's, uh, you know, our universities uh, have major, we've had major problems on our universities. And there's a, there's a, there's a push to decolonize um, yeah, yeah, university that. education. Yeah, and that means everything. That means that yeah. maths. All, all those straight be... white men from the past who yeah. devised well, all well, this Well, stuff. we had yeah. someone that seriously stood up. I mean, it became a bit of a joke. It, it was a YouTube clip that, that that ended up spreading and became viral. The, the girl that stood up and said, you know, um, our notion of what we understand by lightning and yeah. what comes from, you know, famous physicists on uh, on lightning is we must abandon this because who is to say that lightning isn't, um, you know, punishment from the ancestors or whatever she ended up saying, some, yeah. some random how, nonsense. How does the shaman call the lightning? Your science can't explain that. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's true. But, <laughs> but to your point, Carl, um, whiteness and whenever politicians in South Africa talk about that, it is it is a violent rejection of of – of Western culture, generally speaking, mm. because you must look as a for historical context. If you speak to one of these Afro nationalists, uh, racial nationalists, the, the whites came here 400 years ago and oppressed everyone for 400 years, raped mm -hmm. women, extracted minerals, used people as slaves. And obviously, history is much more nuanced. The Afrikaners and Zulus worked together for centuries yeah. against the British, for example. If we could blame anyone, that's you people in Britain. If you fuck this place up, if I'm really honest, um, but <laughs> you people, <laughs> it is. It's true, though. It is true. This mm -hmm. country it should be four countries until the British, you know, that's found that's gold that's, that's, this is all north. French history, it's the British people's fault. <laughs> I, speak, I, 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 identify as a, I identify as a South African uh, this evening, <laughs> but but if you look at the historical context, the Afrikaners are the, the white tribe of Africa. They've been here for four hundred years. Uh, a lot of them have a lot of intermingling between them and, and and black tribes and what's known as the 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 Bushman tribes, the the Khoi and the Sand tribes. Um, a lot of interracial marriages, lots of, I mean, they were, so they became a bit racist later on, but they used the institutions created by the British, you know, to, mm. to, to do that. But if you look at history from the, the African nationalist, race nationalist politician that we have in South Africa now, it's 400 years of oppression. Now it's our turn to oppress. Um, that's it. And, and everything that we can use, including rejecting the entire political and philosophical system, uh, we will do that as well. We will completely Africanize the country. What that means, no one really knows, uh, and that doesn't prevent them from buying Maseratis uh, or using Louis Vuitton handbags or, you know, shooting AK-47s. I mean, they, they quite like the products of Western imperialism. I'm or flying on flying on British first first to uh, New York uh, to for a shopping trip. I noticed that they're communists as well, which is a, an Enlightenment philosophy. It's a Western philosophy. Yes. Well, w w what we have in South Africa is um, during the 1960s, the uh, African National Congress was very close with the Soviets yeah. and, in fact, yeah. trained with them uh, in a military sense, in a political sense, and uh, adopted so that South African Communist Party, which has never actually been a standalone party in this country, it's always been linked to the, the ANC, mm -hmm. um, they adopted uh, what they call the National Democratic Revolution. And the National Democratic Revolution, well, it's, it's not very democratic, um, but it's it's basically um, old school Soviet ideology. And it's the idea that you take over every institution, uh, the government controls everything, you ultimately nationalize everything, you control everything, and, and through that, um, you spread the wealth to the people. So we are on a pathway to socialism and ultimately communism. Um, and the National Democratic Revolution isn't... Uh, a, being hidden by anyone. It's in their formal policy documents. They talk about it in Parliament. Our journalists pretend like it doesn't exist, most of them. Uh, but yes, that's why, um, yes, we, we've we adopted a Western sort of Soviet culture um, and and it, it is very much forms part of, of everything that happens in our mm. government. Well, that's, they're going to have to de African uh, de-Westernize that at some point, aren't they? Decolonialize, get rid well, of the Soviets. I, I think it was Thatcher that said, "Yes, the white man did destroy Africa. They introduced Karl Marx uh, yeah. to it, and yeah. uh, she's not she's not wrong in that uh, in that respect." No, I've, I've mean, had the argument many times. Actually, I, I mean, uh, was it Botswana? Isn't uh, it's a capitalist state? And it's doing really well, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, and and, and 
and uh, Sirret Sekama, the, the first president of the Republic of Botswana, was a, basically an English gentleman. He married a, an English lady uh, and was rejected by his own tribe, and, and she was rejected by the British uh, at the same time. So they sort of had to form this middle ground and you know say non-racialism is a way to go for Botswana. And again, Botswana is not Singapore by any means, but it's the one country that's not a complete shithole. Yeah, I, I looked um, it up that's the actually other day. Growing. Yeah, I looked at it the other day. The average wage is uh, seventeen thousand dollars a year, which American dollars, which is really good for Africa. I mean, oh, yeah, um, the know? other place is Rwanda, which uh, Paul Kagame is. Uh, I, I would say modeling himself on on Singapore. So it is like a, um, a benevolent dictatorship in a way. Mm. Um, he he's very much a strong man. He's surrounded himself with with uh, those types of people, and they know not to kind of step out of line. Um, but it's all for the greater good, so to speak. And it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Um, there's a big debate about whether just straightforward democracy could work in, in Africa, because it never has. Um, and inevitably, people don't always vote for what they probably should, what's in their best interests. Um, so Rwanda should be an interesting um, uh, sort of experiment. Uh, you know, as an ongoing, it's not like we, we've got any control over it, but it should be an interesting ongoing experiment. Rwanda and Botswana are probably the two places that are doing quite well on the continent at the moment. South Africa, well, Sub-Saharan Africa, so Zimbabwe, exclude Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, Namibia, South Africa, all sort of on a downward trend in every sort of metric. Uh, it's quite interesting because even the other countries that, that aren't... Um, you know, liberal in any sort of sense and maybe have had dictators for a long time. So the North African, West African countries are all sort of moving upwards in the world, uh, better metrics in terms of, you know, poor poverty and, and health and all of those things. Um, unfortunately, we're going in the opposite direction, uh, directly related to, to instituting this sort of failed policy of the 20th century. Yeah, and I, I try to explain that to many, many, many different kinds of groups as well. Um, Africa's racked with socialism, and it's killing it. You can, and there, there are examples where it's not being, and it's so like you you eradicate like all sorts of factors um, because it's a, an interesting sort of petri dish. Um, but yeah, it's I don't know. It's, I guess socialism is going to have long echoes, to be honest. Yeah, uh, and uh, and remember, democracy is a process, right? It, uh, yeah. it's t it took what Great Britain a thousand years more longer to become a, a democratic state. Um, you can't just impose it on something, and the Arab Spring showed that. Um, and I think a lot of um, what what m the mistakes people make is that they often look at traditional African culture as being socialistic. But I mean, obviously, it was much more different. It was it was very tribal, but there was quite a lot of free trade between tribes, and and some were nomadic, some had slaves. Uh, so it's not there wasn't like a a common ownership of the means of production by any means. There was there was a totalitarian in terms of in terms of the political system, but people could trade quite freely across Africa. There's there's lots of trade routes from ancient times that were around. Um, but Cole, just back to England, if I may, for just a moment. So you ran a, as an MEP for UKIP, um, and um, unfortunately didn't get a seat in the European Parliament. But um, Bre the Brexit Party did. So I think there was a, obviously a great competition between you two, and I think Nigel Farage had a lot more um, institutional competence and trust. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there, there, there was no, there was no competition. Nigel had the money, the name, and the the agenda. Yeah, you, know, it's, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. There, there, yeah. there was no, no serious thought on my part that we were going to win it over him. Yeah, yeah. But what, if I may say, when you started, I watched all the press conferences, and you and you were very antagonistic towards the press, which I which I quite enjoyed to some degree. But do you think perhaps? you overestimated your your social influence like basically i'm asking does internet influence translate to physical influence in terms of votes yeah i think it does i mean uh, you keep not obviously not to the extent of the national media um mm. but we we definitely did better in the southwest than any other region um 
so I think that, uh, you know, I would suggest that I had something to do with that. So I was actually targeting um, the views in the specific areas uh, using like local hashtags and things like that. And uh, we did actually have uh, millions of unique views in, this, in, in England. And, you know, given how we're down the southwest, it's not unreasonable to infer that it's probably in that sort of region. Um, but obviously, you know, nothing compared to, I don't know, how many dozens and dozens of newspapers and TV shows, you know, obviously. But, um, but I think it's, I think it shows that this sort of thing does have an impact. And it is something that as the traditional media continues to decline and the alternative media continues to grow when we're not being censored, that it's, um, it is a model for a future, which is not there yet. Yeah, no, it is a little bit early. I think Donald Trump is a, is is sort of an anomaly in this case. I think the Twitter, yeah. tw his Twitter game is very very strong, and mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of alternative media coalesced around him in a way. And thirdly, the mainstream media couldn't leave him the hell alone because he was so outrageous, yeah. obviously on purpose. So I mean, you have all those factors, and then he, he's know. also got the advantage of the fact that the media is actually. Um, not uh, aligned with public opinion in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the Washington Post, I think it was, did uh, a survey of um, Mexican immigrants saying, do you think that uh, the Im illegal immigrants should be deported or left to re remain? Uh, and they, I think that they did it because they were expecting ethnic solidarity yeah. on the part of yeah. the Mexicans. But 55% uh, of the Mexicans said deport, and only 7% said remain. Mm. Um, so, yeah, they, it like I, the me and th and this goes for almost every, every subject, you know, for immigration, for anything. Um, the media is generally out of touch. I mean, in my country, seven uh, nine percent of the women in this country, so seven percent overall, are feminists. And the media was debating: is it okay not to be a feminist? Uh, the rest of the country are not feminist. <laughs> like literally over ninety percent of the country, and something like thirty percent of the country is actively anti-feminist. They find feminism to be hurting men. They don't like it. Um, so. It's it's the reason that the media never engaged with any of our, our ideas. It was all smears, and it's all smears of everyone all the time as soon as they step out of line. And they've done mm. this with Boris Johnson as well. But um, the thing is, there's no way of them removing Boris Johnson. Uh, normally, the media do this in order to prevent, uh, you know, because the public is still vulnerable, frankly, to reading headlines that are all just negative. You know, like they do, everyone... The, the 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 great mass of people who don't follow politics and just see headlines in their timeline yeah. and stuff like that is this wrong by um it does it does you know puts a sub a, a a sort of subliminal message almost saying look you know you just don't like this person um and they just don't think about it in the car in the day um so there's no denying that the media still has influence obviously but um and I, I agree with you completely that Donald Trump is a complete outlier he's an outrider in this regard <laughs> um but I think that going into the future the problems will get worse more people will be exposed to them and the alternative media voice will be louder yeah i'm 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 wondering where that tipping point is i mean you're talking about you know such small numbers who support a lot of these things i think it's i think that would be true for for most of their subjects uh, and and the, the the thing i find so odd is that it's not just the guardian anymore publishing mm sort of these random left-wing insanities. It's not even left-wing ideas. It's just insanity. You know, did women in, 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 in communist, uh, you know, communist Russia have better sex? Um, why, you know, what, uh, you know, putting men That's on really the moon. Tapping into the dissatisfied middle-class housewife. We are putting, graphic there. putting men on the moon was a misogynist, racist, <laughs> um, uh, you know, yeah. thing. I, you know, missing the entire point of, putting man on the moon, you know, the mm. humans on the moon. That was the achievement. Uh, um, not to mention that there were a number of women actually involved in that. Um, but but it, 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 th these are things appearing in the New York Times. Uh, these are things oh, appearing yeah. in the Washington Post. Um, the, 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 the entire uh, media network is, is completely overrun by this uh, in what I would say are actually very unpopular opinions for the most part. Yeah. Uh, you see this even in the support of politicians, uh, what Donald Trump's now recently done with the so-called squad uh, and bringing them to the fore. These are, these are some of the most unpopular congresswomen in the United States. Um, and, and, and the media are rallying around them as if, as if they, uh, you know, could run for the presidency tomorrow and win. And, and none of them have a hope in hell. Uh, so, 
So it's. It, I just wonder. Do you think there's there's a tipping point? Uh, do you think there's I, there's there has to be at some point. Um, it, it can't go on like this forever with the media being against, uh, like antipathetic towards the population at, at large. Like that cannot go on forever. Um, and that that I think a lot of that is what we saw in Brexit and Trump as well. Because I mean the. Man, the insufferable media calling everyone a racist because they, vote, they they wanted to vote for Brexit. It's like just yeah. like just shut up. You know we don't need your opinion on what isn't isn't racist. And that's th this thing with Donald Trump's tweets. Like the tweet itself was a specific commentary on four women, and they were like, "That's racist." It's like, no, that's not. That's actually he's singling out four people. You know, he like that's the opposite of racism. He's not generalizing the entire race. He's singling out four people and saying, why don't you guys leave if you hate America? He, wasn't he, didn't, saying, even, he didn't even sell them to, I just, I, look, I'm not, I don't fully uh, like his tweet, but I, I, the, I, there's a lot of stuff that gets misinterpreted. And yes. the, point, the point on that tweet was, he said, you should go back um, to kind of where you come from and fix that place and then come back and teach us something so there's yeah. there you know even the way it's he wasn't even saying get out you know he yeah was saying, he wasn't saying get out don't come yeah. back or you're not americans or you're not welcome here he was going you think you have it all figured out why don't you go fix yeah. these other places yeah. um i do think he misstepped in that because well, ilan omar is the only one that actually comes from another place personally well, the, 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 yeah but the thing is what he's referring to there is the hyphenated american you know, I'm a Palestinian American. I'm a Somali American. Mm. It's like, okay, well, if if you are, you know, if you're going to take this and be proud of your Somali identity or Palestinian identity or whatever it is, mm. I can't remember the other two are from. Um, if if that's a core part of your identity and that's like what you're drawing on when you criticize the United States, let's have a look at the home country you're you're drawing from. And you know, Palestine and Somalia are not great examples of well-run states. And so, you know, saying, look, go fix them before you start lecturing to me, the president of the US, how I run the US. Because I actually, I, you know, because Donald Trump in his mind, he's an American American, you know, mm. he's not, you know, if you're going to hyphenate Donald Trump, that's what he's thinking of. And so what he perceives is them just hating the United States, but having no legitimacy because the moral impetus they're drawing from seems to be crap. So, you know, that's what he's saying. It's like, well, fix Palestine, fix Somalia, then tell me how to run my country, you know, but it's not, again, like, it's not really about the race. It's really about the attitude. And that's the thing he's going after. So like, look, you seem to do no, I mean, like an Ilhan Omar, right? I'm, I'm actually, well, after this, yeah. I'm going to carry on editing this long video I'm doing about it. Mm. She, she was addressing the question of whether she hated America before Donald Trump tweeted this, yeah. because she's been told so many times she seems to just hate I, America. I was just going to say, there's no context here because Ilhan yeah. Omar has been spending the last few years uh, yeah. ac actually showing everyone just how much she doesn't like America, how <laughs> yes. much she doesn't appreciate America, who basically saved yeah. her from yeah. a, a life of yeah, misery a, in a yeah. refugee camp. <laughs> yeah. um, and, 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 and not only that, has spent the last uh, year and a half, I think it is, railing against Israel in often the most anti-Semitic terms and in the most anti-Semitic ways. And that, that just gets thrown out. So Trump makes this commentary, which I, as I say, I'm not nuts about how he, he sort of phrased the tweet and what he said. He, he, but he the point is, is, in context of a woman and several women who've actually been going against what America stands for um, yeah. and what America's allies stand for um, is, is you know, there's a lot bigger a conversation to be had. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's very definitely the part of a big cultural sort of um – Almost like a, again a war, I suppose you'd call it. But the the way the way the way Trump phrased it was entirely deliberate because what di what he did was a dog whistle to the radical left. Like Richard Spencer yeah, yeah. went on CNN and said, "I'm not impressed with this," but the <laughs> radical left thought this was hell on earth, and they yeah. went nuts. You know, no, no, this, this like idea of him point. rallying rallying those yeah. making those four women the face of the Democratic Party. If if he manages to keep them the face for 2020. He wins the election by a landslide, not well, just by debates, a bit. The debates yeah. looked like they were. You know, they, they you do support healthcare for illegal immigration. And they're all, what are you doing? You know, yeah. nobody even supports illegal immigrants being in the country, let alone the the American citizen paying for their health care that's <laughs> absolutely nuts. Speaking <laughs> Spanish on the stage, I, I was saying to people like, but imagine if what if if our in in Britain our candidates got up and started speaking in Arabic, you'd be like, what? Like exactly, it's that kind of you know sort of what are you doing? You know, 
I mean, even Obama was like, if you want to come and be a citizen, you've got to learn to speak English. You know, even Obama was like, no, you've got to learn to speak English as a requirement to be an American citizen. But Obama right? was against illegal immigration. So Absolutely. was Hillary Clinton. So were Absolutely. most Democrats up until yeah. that five years ago. Bill Clinton built a wall. <laughs> like, he put a big border <laughs> fence along the southern border. He like, built, built like 3,000 miles of it or something like that. No complaints. Everyone was applauding him. Standing ovation. It's really quickly how this... And it is like the consequence of intersectionality. It's effectively the sort of social socialism uh, applied to every aspect of life. You know, Marxism applied to every aspect. I mean, you guys know this, you know. Yeah. yeah no, it's about not having any categories in life anyway. Everything is, yeah. is fluid and uh, going yeah. towards a, yeah. a progressive utopia. And utopians are the most dangerous people uh, in totally the world. Uh, but having a Trump presidency, I think, is really, really good for the prospects of Brexit. Mm. Um, I just feel Theresa May obviously absolutely clueless and useless. Uh, do you think Boris Johnson, I assume he'll be uh, in, whatever PM, PM quite yeah. soon, yeah. can he leverage the relationship with Trump to push Brexit through despite the EU being assholes in a way? No question of it. Um, I'm very, very enthusiastic at the prospect of a Boris, uh, Boris uh, PM ship um, because it, essentially I think he realizes what's going on. Um, Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party are scaring the living daylights out of the Tories, as they should be, yep. um, and basically saying, look, you're going to get us out of the European Union cleanly, you know, deal or no deal, uh, or we're going to eat you, and then we're going to do it. Um, and Boris Johnson has taken this to heart, and he's written about this in The Telegraph and various other publications, and he's, he's said, look, deal or no deal, we're leaving on October the 31st, which is when the extension runs out. Um, he has also made sure that his cabinet is packed with people who will accept no deal, or he will do. Uh, he's been you know, threatening this. Um, he's he's basically very, very, very much on the side of, oh, God, we have to leave or else we're going to die, um, which is good. And the fact that Trump is so so much of an Anglophile um, is definitely a huge uh, Trump card, as it were, in his hand. Um, you know, it, it really is. Because, I mean, if it was Obama, he Obama said that he would put... Um, Britain to the back of the queue. Yeah, which, yeah. Which I remember that. That was, the, was a week before your election, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and yeah, uh, wasn't considered yeah. to be collusion or interference in a foreign election. No, it's it's weird, that isn't it? But um, but yeah. So the, the fact that Trump, I mean, and he recently reiterated it was literally, I think, yesterday I saw this, uh, where he was saying how he likes Boris Johnson very much and he's going to have a very good uh, relationship with him and whatnot. And I'm like, okay, good. You know, <laughs> I mean, he's been offering us this amazing deal. Uh, basically, you know, he's. We have we have many options, and Donald Trump's a very strong one, and Boris Johnson will be able to leverage this. Um, whether he gets anything done or not is questionable because the EU have already put their guard up and said, no, 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 no. Um, so we'll probably leave with no deal, which means that America there to do deals with is ideal. Um, so yeah, no, I'm quite confident about it, actually. All right. I mean, and, and if he doesn't, the backup plan is, I assume, Nigel for PM. Maybe sometime next year. I'm not too sure what the how the elections work in your country. Uh, there's one. There's one every six months at the yeah, stage. Yeah, well, no, practically. Uh, no, it won't be for another. I think roughly three years. The next general election. Um, and I, I just can't envisage a situation where we're still in. Um, after three years, like the general mood towards Brexit is one of total apathy and just get it done. You know, apart right. from the the shrieking remainers who are still. And and they sound just wild at this point. Like when I was on the Southwest tour, I went on the BBC, and uh, the 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 lady who actually won the Southwest for the Greens, uh, I was talking in opposition to her, and she came out with just the most ridiculous narrative of you know Russia did it, uh, you know, and just fake news and all this all this long convoluted narrative. And the host just said, "Come on, Molly, that's nonsense, isn't it?" Because it was everyone at this point has realised that people believed in something. They they. They probably were had severe convictions in advance of even hearing anyone's opinion on it, and so it's one of those things where and the, the polling shows that the opinion on this has barely changed over time. It's locked in, you know, um, and so it's one of those things where everyone's just like, "Let's just get it over with. Just you know, just pull the bloody plaster off and just get it done." Yeah, and God willing, October thirty first. Uh, let's hope that does happen yeah. and uh, i mean I, i'm very glad boris johnson he's been my favorite politician as a as a sort of you know jester a court he's jester great, for, for like 
the past 15 years and now he's actually yeah. going to do it so like sort of pinching myself in a way but then again uh, i was surprised with trump yeah. who knows anything is possible these days but don't get me wrong i'm not against the idea of a nigel prime ministership i think that would be hilarious and i think that he'd be very he, he could if he could find the stones to do it uh, go after some very important issues yeah. If you think they lost their minds after Brexit, I can only yeah. imagine what people would do if Nigel was was the PM. It would be legitimately hilarious. But, but, yeah. but don't you think uh, Farage might be probably the, the the most important politician since Thatcher? Oh, definitely. He's the, easily the most influential politician in the country at the moment. Um, yeah, when, but, but even, when, I mean, even over the sorry to interrupt, but even over, yeah. over the past twenty over the past twenty odd years or so, ever since the founding of UKIP, I believe it was ninety four, ninety three, somewhere around something there. Something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, he, he bloody well got it. I mean, if you yeah. told me, if you told me, you know, five years ago that the EU is something that's to be and not trusted and that Britain will leave. I would have said, whatever. If you told me in 2014 that immigration would be the biggest issue in Western politics, I would have said, whatever. But somehow these things just come up and people buy into the idea. And it takes, I don't know, it takes real effort for people to buy into those ideas. Or maybe it's just a question of putting up a public signal and then people naturally say, oh, fuck, finally someone talking about it. Boom, let's go support them. I mean, that's quite a special thing. I think I think from our perspective, I think to be honest with you, if if I had to put the most significant prime minister since uh, Thatcher, it'd be Blair. Um, I think that his policies have been so wide reaching, and then Gordon Brown afterwards, I suppose, is a corollary. Um, but his his policies have had such a deep and wide ranging impact on the on the country itself um, that it's I think it's really hard to overstate that, and I don't think people realised because. He didn't seem very threatening. You know, he seemed, and everyone gets focused on the Iraq war. It's like, okay, but he was the one who started opening the borders. He's the one who brought in all the hate speech laws. He's, you know, it's, it's under labor that all of these quangos and all of these like socialistic um, organs were created in government mm -hmm. to essentially micromanage the society. And, you know, the conservatives didn't do that, you know, and, and these are very wide ranging. They're very well funded and they're very embedded because they've been there for like 20 years. And so there are generations that have grown up thinking that we should have, that there's no way we shouldn't have, say, a Women in Equalities Commission, which just sounds like something that the Soviet Union would have had. You know, I don't, I don't see why we would need an Equalities Commission. That sounds terrifying. But, you know, so it's, it's all this stuff that, uh, but I mean, I, but the thing is, I don't want to take anything away from Nigel Farage because for, for sort of like our side of the, the argument, he absolutely is. You know, he's, I think that, that's the, that's the thing with the, the MEP elections. It was like, look, Farage is the guy who got Brexit. You know, it's it's his face. It was his charismatic speaking. And, you know, him standing on a pyramid of people who were supporting him. But that's what the public remember, and that's what the public were moved by. Um, and so, yeah, there's no there's no denying that, my, that Nigel Farage, I mean, currently, that's why he's the most influential politician in my country. Um, it's amazing. And I'm really glad mm. that he's kicking their asses, to be honest. What do you make of the dichotomy? I mean, yes, Nigel's been around for a while now and he's he's been influential in many ways, but there seems to be an obvious dichotomy between the likes of Trump, Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, the sort of uh, very honest in character individuals um, who seem to act like who they really are. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Boris, you can kind of, you feel like you know who he would be if you sat down and had a cup of tea or a drink with him. Same yeah. for Donald Trump um, and, and for Nigel. And then on the other side, someone like Tony Blair, uh, who I think always had a smile on his face, always seemed to be saying the right thing, but obviously was slowly passing little laws behind, you know, most of the population don't notice what happens in Parliament yeah, or the Commons yeah. or whatever it is. Um, um, and, and we're slowly passing these authoritarian laws, which often uh, the left very good at this. They pass, uh, they intend to pass uh, one giant law, but they don't do it as one giant law, right? They pass 10 laws that ultimately make the one giant law. Yeah, uh, yeah. This happens, this has happened over two decades in South Africa now. We, 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 you know, people said they'll never be able to take away the land. And then they slowly passed like five yeah. or six different acts that actually made it possible to today to take away people's private yeah. property. Um, Barack Obama was a similar character, and in fact, probably I think the iconic character of of the last probably 
60 years um, in that sense. Uh, just a guy who could uh, lie to your face in the most brilliant way. You know, if you want, if you if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. People believed that, voted for him based on that. Um, so he had incredible PR, didn't he, Obama? Oh, like, unbelievable, yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable PR. Yeah. A great orator. I mean, he literally hired yep. fiction writers to be his policy people. Uh, <laughs> so, so you know, Ben Rhodes is a fiction writer. Uh, that's 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 that was his job, and and this is the guy who put together the Iran deal, um, but was also informing some of his speakers Features and and other policy, it, it, but but people loved him for that. They loved the, that he was like that. But I, I feel like there's a rejection of that. There's mm. people feel like they've had the wool pulled over their eyes for too long now by politicians. Um, they they know all politicians are liars, all of them, even the charismatic mm. ones. Um, and so they'd rather have someone who comes a bit comes off a bit more authentic, and who they can kind of see some of the warts on, than mm. someone who's perfectly polished. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I think um, I think that the the age of the corporate politician is um, definitely kind of losing its shine, if nothing else. Uh, I think there is a desire to have politicians be essentially perfect, but I think a charismatic politician who isn't can get away with it a lot more easily now. Um, and I mean, Donald Trump's doing a great job in that regard. Mm. Um, but I do, I do wonder because I know there, there, there is a strong pull towards like prim being prim and proper, but um, but you are right. The the people who are succeeding most at the moment are those ones who are the more sort of transparent in their 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 status as regular people. You know, that's, that's the thing that's appealing about them because I think really it's about trust in who you're working with and working for. Um, I think a corporate politician, the kind of smiley, slimy, greasy look. Um, I think that now has the kind of air about it of someone who is acting in the interests of multinationals and foreign governments and things like this, um, because they've been bought off by these people. Whereas someone like a Donald Trump, um, or a Boris Johnson, they feel less like that. That's the case. They, I mean, Trump, in fact, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily include Boris in this actually. Um, but Trump definitely has a really great, um, image in regards to what he does with his audience um because it's obvious he's acting in their interests you know like he's he's not being bought off because he's independently wealthy and he loves doing these rallies where he just stands there and talks to them for an hour about whatever crap has crossed his mind right, dude, you know, he's the best he's stand-up like, comedian since like chris rock i mean yeah yeah he's, he's, he's <laughs> certainly most successful isn't he i mean you know and he's packing these in and you can tell the crowds are loving it they're totally engaged with what he's doing and he's just chatting to them about you know like whatever was on his mind and uh and so that i think you can say that donald trump's a lot of things but questioning questioning his allegiance to the american people is not one of them you know, in fact, it's a very firm place for him to stand to attack Ilhan Omar and people like that who constantly have to answer to that allegation anyway. Um, so, yeah, and I, I think there is a, a, the, the necessity to act in the interest of the nation now, like the, the regular person who's just like, hang on, stuff's changing and I don't know why. You know, I'm going to vote for some guy who's saying, well, I'm for you. You know, I'm going to do whatever, you know. Um, whatever they're promising. I think there is an appealing element to that. There's the, you know, it, I think it forms a strong bond of trust. Yeah. And the scene to live made this point as well. So Trump is often mocked for his like failed business enterprises and his bankruptcy and, mm -hmm. you know, cozying up to politicians as a property developer. And Taleb said, well, you know, people go bankrupt every single day. Yeah. Uh, you know, people make deals with people they don't like to get ahead every single bloody day. It's called business. So yeah. if you see a politician or someone wanting to have political power and they had failures in the past, it makes them far more human than mm. the one who's never failed or the one who's always been perfect. Yeah. Uh, and obviously it's much more relatable to speak to someone or vote for someone uh, who, you know, appears to have failed in, in the same manner that you have as a person. Because life is, 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 is the, is like that for most people. We fail, we succeed, uh, we make deals. Uh, that's what life is about. And this guy's done it for 30, 40 years. So you know, I'll just uh, find him a lot more relatable and I'll vote for him. I think um, the, the thing about Trump's business, like Trump, Trump's a, a magnate. He's got lots of different businesses. And one of the natural consequences of having like a dozen different businesses is that a few of them are going to fail. Um, 
but that didn't stop him from becoming a billionaire from being a millionaire so it's and it's much like his policies actually you know you can say whatever you like about donald trump and how he's not perfect blah 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 but it seems to be going quite well in america at the moment like everything's actually yeah. going great and it's the same with brexit here like you can whine all you like but the, you're like for example wages are up 3.5 percent uh joblessness is down to the lowest level since the 70s um and you've like all of these positive factors like construction workers are now earning over forty three thousand pounds a year and stuff like this so it's you know all of these increases that are going really well for just the regular person in the country and you know you can say, well, Trump's an idiot. Okay, maybe he is, but at least he knows how to run a country. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah no, I fully agree with you. I, I'm not sure if you saw um, the monk debate between Steve Bannon and I think it was David French. Uh, I, I think did, it's... David Frum, yes. I did see that. Frum, it was excellent, sorry. wasn't it? Yeah. It was, although, Steve, although one with French would be fun as well. <laughs> well yeah, but, but, but Steve Bannon sort of surprised me. At, at It was the first time I've seen him speak uninterrupted mm. ever. Uh, and and he did surprise me. He said, you know, the future is populist. You yeah. can choose the left or you can choose the right, but the future is populist. And at the time, I didn't really believe him. Then I read Matthew Goodwin's book, uh, uh, Populism, the Revolt Against Democracy, uh, against liberalism, I'm sorry. And he also makes that same argument. You know, populism is here to stay. It's a long-term mm -hmm. trend um, across Europe and the Western world. What is your view on that excuse me, uh, that national populism and, and how far will it go in a way uh, for, for post-Brexit Britain and Europe generally? Well, one of, one of the reasons I think is worth um, the classical liberals um, aligning with this kind of movement, like I said at the beginning, is broadly I don't think they're necessarily against the, the, the sort of the principles that we believe in, but um, also I think is to act as a safeguard because I think there there is obviously a danger of any kind of nationalistic populist movement becoming tyrannical there is obviously a danger of this and i think it would be incumbent on the sort of more liberally minded people to say okay that a there's nothing that's inherently wrong with it but the extremities are of course bad like the extremities are almost everything are bad so we should support this and moderate it and like try and try and steer it in the right direction rather than allowing someone else to steer it in the wrong direction yeah, no, I think it's quite it's quite a lot easier to not infiltrate the group, but to befriend the group and say or join it. Yeah, yeah or, or join I don't it. Disagree, way. You know? <laughs> and 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 say so, you know these these elements on the yeah. side here, like you know the the the, the real KKK and the, the real oh, yeah, Aryan yeah, yeah. Brotherhood, they're not really good for you. So I mean, stay away from them. Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, you mo know, most people agree with that. Most people already agree with that. Yeah, no, they do. So it's, it's it's really not a very difficult argument to have. Yeah. Okay. So, so the future is populist for you, uh, Carl Benjamin. You think, think it's uh, it's something that's it going to stay? I I think um, I think it, I think it will be until things start getting better, and then when things start getting better, people will essentially relax their guard, and the radical left types will continue their mission. I I don't think they're ever going to stop. Mm. So it's Sorry, quite worrying. Just one more point. Sorry, Jonathan. One more. Sure. But but things are the best they've been in decades, though. Yes. So uh, are the best have been in millennia. Well, 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 in uh, well it, depends in what, in, it depends in what way you, you mean, but things are only good if you can keep performing the behaviors that make things good. And as you can see with, say, South Africa at the moment, you, there is definitely the chance to sort of roll back that and go and decline. Mm. You know, there's definitely... Uh, it, it's not this thing. A lot of people like look at history as if it was inevitable, and things are not inevitable at all. No, you know, yes, and, no. and it, it's... It's also been a really rare point in human uh, civilization that we've been at um, because of the constant growth. Most civilizations go up and down as catastrophe uh, befall them, you know, um, and most civilizations looked at the past with an eye of the past being better than the present as well. Uh, yep. It's quite rare that the, the people in the present look at the past with an eye to being worse than they are now. Um, and, but I think that is an accurate way of looking at it. And I think that if we don't... Um, do the things that made us successful in the first place, then we will lose the things that we have. And I think that's where the radical left goes wrong. I think that they think that we're here now and we will never go back. And so we can do anything in the present and we'll always have a better uh, result going forward. And it's like, no, I think that the, what you're doing could lead us backwards. And mm. I think that, that in fact, there's a guarantee. Yeah, I mean, civilization is the thin veneer, uh, and it's it's, yeah. you know, it's worth it's worth protecting and defending. Jonathan, yeah. sorry, I interrupted you. No, I just on the populism point, I think 
you know, I think populism is here to stay for the time being simply because of social media. I think that, um, you, you know, I, I, I call social media the democratization of stupid um, because <laughs> while I do while I do see the value in, in everyone having a voice, I mean, I, I originally got onto Twitter because I was like, this is unbelievable. I can send, at the time, there weren't that many people on Twitter and I could send you know, Barack Obama, Will Smith, whatever, um, a, a tweet, and they would probably read it um, at that time. Uh, and and so it was quite unbelievable to be able to to communicate with these people. And in fact, I made a lot of friends with 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 people who I otherwise would never have otherwise come into contact with. Um, but now we have a situation where you know, a few billion people are on social media platforms. Uh, I'm sure there will be almost 100% saturation eventually, uh, probably within the next 10 years, uh, unless you actively choose not to be on it. Every human is going to be on some sort of social media platform. And I think what, that, what that's done is, is it allows everyone, as we can see from places like Twitter, to just express their sort of idea or opinion on how they think the world should be. Uh, a lot of that is really dumb. Uh, but it allows it allows groups to sort of coalesce around specific ideas, uh, which otherwise you would never have known. If you're sitting, you know, in the middle of South Africa, and I happen to tweet something, and you happen to agree with it, and uh, someone else in Poland agrees with that, and and so you get this sort of snowball effect, and and mm -hmm. suddenly there's there's actually an issue a whole bunch of people can end up being millions agree with, um, and I think I think we've seen that over over social media. I think that's that's what's happened, and I think it's driving a lot of the populism, or it's certainly supporting it. Um, so so I think in, until we either have a control, which is something I wanted to talk to you about, until we either have a control, which I'm not uh, in favor of, um, mm -hmm. or uh, it gets shut down, or we move on to the next big thing, I'm not sure populism disappears. Uh, you've been censored on lots of platforms. Um, you've been no, censored. Not that on, many. Well, tw okay, you've been censored on Twitter. Um, yeah. They, they, uh, unfortunately, because your tweets were great, I thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> them. I thought, I thought, you know, package-sized. Uh, Package size call was great, um, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately we don't get that anymore. Yeah, um, uh, YouTube, uh, I, you know, pr probably demonetizes you uh, oh, yeah, regularly yeah. and and yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I, I consider that a form of censorship because yeah. you know they're dropping you in, in in search ratings as well and and mm -hmm. and other things. We've seen sort of these leaks that have come out of these large uh, uh, social media entities. Uh, which are, you know, basically them admitting that they want to either try or have, in fact, um, mm -hmm. censored various people um, or various views. Uh, where do you where do you think we're going with all of this? It's kind of worrying. Um, just uh, sorry to get off, but um, I've got yeah. to go fairly soon because I'm, I'm still editing a video. No, thank you, thank uh, you for your time. But um, but the yeah, the, this is a good question though. Um, Ted Cruz and Donald Trump look like they're quite serious about the social media censorship issue, which is very one-sided towards right-wing. Uh, people, but this this really means uh, anyone outside of the sort of corporate consensus. So you can look at people like Kyle Kalinsky and David Packman, who are getting actively uh, sort of shaved away through the soft censorship as well. Um, but it it does mostly affect right wingers. Um, but either way, it's um, I think it's something that they're consciously doing, and I think it's because they're afraid of Donald Trump winning again in twenty twenty. Um, I think that they wouldn't, I mean, they didn't really care until it seemed that we were winning, you know, they, before Brexit and Trump, they didn't do this uh, because I think they were arrogant and thought that they had it in the bag, um, especially given their polling, you know, but, um, but I think there was a significant influence from the internet. And I think that they're very conscious of this and they seek to mitigate it now. And you can see this, uh, this kind of soft censorship in a lot of things. I mean, the Google search engine, uh, auto completes except on certain political phrases like Hillary Clinton's emails, it fails to auto complete, but Donald Trump's emails does auto complete. It's very interesting. Um, but it's Jeffrey it's, it's, Epstein was the latest example of this. Uh, oh, Jeffrey really? Epstein, oh. Jeffrey Epstein and, Donald Trump will come up, but Jeffrey Epstein and Bill Clinton doesn't come up. And wow. if you type and if you type and Bill, it won't come up with Clinton. 
That's um, very so, interesting, isn't it? So but, yeah. yeah, and and it's and it's not just that. Like uh, the the recommendations on videos, things like this. Um, it's very obvious that large sections of YouTube are being actively suppressed. Uh, these are the independent content creators, people like David Pakman, who uh, recently showed his statistics in the video, and there's just this just arbitrary drop off. You know, his numbers are pretty good until you know, and it's the same for everyone. It's it's obvious that this is being done. Um, and there's very little recourse that we've got. So we can only hope that Donald Trump and Ted Cruz and those types actually do manage to achieve something here. But he had the social media summit with some very interesting people there, which drove the media nuts. Um, and I think that it's a very strong move and he should carry on in that direction and do whatever he, he can do to try and bring just a bit of fairness to it. Because I think the original thought was never that there was going to be a right wing and a left wing internet. You know, I think it was assumed that everyone would be sharing the same platforms. And uh, now you're seeing an active attempt to prevent that from being the case. Yeah, well, I'm not anti-technology, but if you think big data companies are not harmful in some way, like you need to have your head oh, yeah. checked. Um, uh, the, the, they do have ideologies. They do want to assault certain uh, characteristics, certain behaviors, certain philosophies. Uh, and, and the answer to that is more competition. Uh, I'm not one to regulate big tech companies because I think the the existence is not indefinite at all. I think uh, they will disappear in 10 years and something else will come up. Uh, but if they could just be honest about what they're doing, it would be great too. But mm. I think personally, they they can't be honest because they actually don't know what they're doing half the time. Uh, Jack was on, Jack Dorsey was on Joe Rogan and you can see the guy was sort of like, he's a First Amendment guy, free speech, but he actually doesn't know how Twitter works. He doesn't know what the, Trust and yeah. Safety Council, whatever Stalinist yeah. term they give it, what they actually do. Uh, so uh, there's a huge, this is brand new tech that we're still trying to figure out in a way. So some people yeah, are yeah, malicious, think... but most, I believe, are just incompetent or, or, or don't know what to do. So they're trying all sorts of things. It very is, um, it very much is that they're riding a sort of monster of their own creation. Uh, you can see it in people like Jack as well. Uh, I mean, he he maxed out his donations to Tulsi Gabbard, which mm -hmm. was widely reported on because that's a political move. That's and that that's a move with political meaning. Um, it what it means is that Jack Dorsey is not a radical identitarian and wants to actually be a bit more centrist because uh, that's Tulsi Gabbard's platform. She's openly repudiated identity politics uh, recently, and she's you know very much like anti-war, pro-American uh, sort of center of left uh, left of center Democrats, um, which would be great if the Democratic Party wasn't so radical uh, in its at least media presence. Um, and but yeah, like you say, you know, I think that the I think the trust and safety councils are the ones calling the shots in this regard. I think that the the CEOs, some of the CEOs are really ideological, like Tim Cook, um, people like that are very ideological. But I think a lot of them, like uh, Jack Conte from Patreon and Jack Dorsey, I think they're trapped between a rock and a hard place where they've got these intense pressures on both sides, and they weren't ever really expecting to have this much influence over society. I mean, I, I genuinely think that Mark Zuckerberg would probably thank Donald Trump for breaking up Facebook. And, and I, just I, to point something rather obvious out, most of these guys are programmers. Programmers are not yeah. usually the most yeah. socially um, uh, adept individuals on Earth. Um, so these are guys who've been thrust into the spotlight in a way, and I, I don't, I'm not sure that many of them cope very well with it um, or know yeah. what to do with it. They, they, they're not, um, you know, Jack doesn't. He doesn't uh, come across to me as a as an antisocial character, but he, he he also doesn't come across to me as someone who who really wants all of this attention. Um, I just on just responding to Ramon, sorry to interrupt, but to just responding to him is I think you've got to find the balance between, you know, competition and people being told, you know, start your own Google uh, because because um, the, the, there's problems with that. You know, people you mentioned banking now being stopped from people. So you've got, you know, you need start your own YouTube, start your own uh, sort well, of the, Google. There's much in regards to that anyway, because uh, Google was started with government money anyway. So it, it came out of Stanford, I think it was. So it's not like this was a product of the free market. So why should we treat it like a product of the free market? You know, this is a government a government funded thing. Why can't we treat it that way? Um, but also, I think that there, there's a sort of 
I think that there is an amount of influence and power that one can wield over society where even though technically it might still be a market, um, it's not necessarily a free market. Um, if Google can, if Google is the, is the way that competitors would be expected to make themselves known, then I think that's way too much power that Google has. You know, it's not, you, you can't expect Google really to facilitate the rise of competitors. But then if Google is the way that anyone communicates or yeah. finds anything, you know, it's not fair to those people who want to be competitors. So I think a balance does have to be struck there. You know, I think that there is a size and scale um, factor that matters there. Or we can just go for Peter Thiel, accuse them of treason, and throw them in jail. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, but uh, where's the lie? Uh, <laughs> they're uh, they're with the Chinese government, aren't they? Peter Thiel's the goat. I like him a lot. Yeah, Carl, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. we won't take any more of your time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have you. And I'll have you know, Carl, when, when you were kicked off Patreon, we deleted our account there and lost oh, literally yeah. dozens of dollars a month. Man, I'm uh, really sorry solid, about that. In solidarity with you. Thank so, you. Um, Honor in South Africa goes a long way. <laughs> man, thanks. I, no, no, I really appreciate that. And honestly, I'd like to apologize. I, I obviously had no idea that Patreon would get me in trouble for that. I mean, I, I thought yeah. I'm not even on my channel, let alone doing it on Patreon. No, but but that I, was, I mean, that was the principle of it. Eh? It was, yeah. it was, it was. Firstly, it was what you said. Nobody engaged with the context, which is not unheard of these yeah. days because the context never matters now to people. What someone's actually saying, it's just they said a word, so therefore yeah. they must be demonized. And then the fact that it had nothing to do with the platform you were actually on. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we we had no actual... I mean, Ramon's joke, not joking about about the, the, the loss, but but he is joking about the, any regret because... I think we felt that uh, that was just a step too far, and uh, and we still feel that way. No, but, 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 I, honestly, I really appreciate that. No, no, but, um, Carl, the pleasure is all one. I mean, that's not a pleasure. The pleasure is all out. But it, I, th I think it was a, a very important lesson for us, too, that we need to control the platform ourselves. So we got donation buttons on our website, and you know, in the long run, it will suit us better anyway. But, Carl, thank you so much. Um, best of luck for... Your YouTube channels, both of them, thank you. and uh, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. We really enjoy your content, and uh, you know, once again, thank you for joining us. It's been a real for, pleasure. Last oh. thing for those uh, South Africans who don't know you, I don't think there are many that listen to the show, but uh, we are growing each week uh, and each month. So, do you want to just punt all your stuff quickly? Oh yeah, um, just uh, on YouTube, my channel is called Saga of a Cad, um, and obviously, stuff's there. I've got a second channel called The Thinkery as well, but I put uh, shorter and more poorly edited videos up on but um <laughs> thank you thank no, no i do it's, you know I, I like it takes me days to edit a, and record a proper one but uh these ones are just because it takes so long to do one long yeah. big video it's just right i'll just you know somewhere where i want to put hot takes basically um but it's always quite fun um but no thank you so much for having me on and if you ever want to have me on again just let callum know and i'm more than happy to make the time thank you so much thanks thanks for joining us anytime cheers guys bye cheers eh? Right, right, Ramon, that was uh, a great chat. I'm sure everyone will appreciate the uh, time uh, that uh, Carl joined us and we put in, of course. Um, those will be the donations rolling in right now as we speak. Right, uh, renegadereport.co.za. Uh, come look at our website. Uh, yeah, if, you, if you're British and you have one pound, that, I think that can pay my rent for two months. So your money goes a long way in, in Africa. I'm just joking about two months. It's more like three. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you for joining us once again. It's an extra long episode. We thank Carl for spending a lot more time than expected with us. And uh, we'll see you the next time around. Yes, as always, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, on Facebook, the page and the group, uh, on Twitter at Renegade underscore report. Ramon is at Roman Kabanak, myself at Jonathan underscore Witt. Thank you for joining us and we'll catch you next time. Cheers.